Really, um, very many uh, biotech industry, there are all kinds of rules about what you will be able to uh, have access to practicing, what technologies you'll be allowed to do that may be uh, overlapped with something else. So, optometrist, optician, ophthalmologist, right? People get those confused all the time. Because in other countries, they don't even have optometrists, right? So, ophthalmology, you're going through med school, and then you do your last two years sort of a specialty like you would with uh, cardiologists or dermatologists, right? But you specialize in ophthalmology. Optometry, uh, we're learning about the, the eyes specifically and testing the eyes for, for refractive errors, for glasses, for contact lenses, all those four years, and then tying in the systemic health problems, right? And then opticians, uh, will grind the lenses, and then in some countries they're also allowed to write prescriptions for glasses. Right? So those are the three. So you can see there are some overlaps in what the three do. So that's the piece of the pie that they're fighting for. So that's what we were warned about. Uh, in other countries, they don't even have optometrists. And if you want to continue to become an optometrist, then you must educate others about what you actually do how you provide care for the rest of the public, um, and that without optometrists, then you wouldn't actually be able to um, access care. Um, so for example, uh, optometrists are almost three to one more, more optometrists practice than ophthalmologists. So when we have our population aging, and every single one of them will need glasses, at least reading glasses, how do you fill in that gap without that, okay? So what we were educated about is, look, you have to tell people because otherwise, legislation would say, well, even though you learned how to treat glaucoma in this country or in this state, you can't practice to treat glaucoma, okay? So is that somewhat clear to you what legislated profession means? Yeah, just because you're taught and you're, you're tested to do a particular technique, it doesn't mean that in that particular state you can practice to actually treat that patient. And nothing frustrates uh, someone who has studied all those years uh, more than to not be able to practice what you were taught. So as taught legislation is always what we would be educated and fighting for. So I said, okay, so that's how it works. When you care about something, you make sure you educate others about it, and you make sure that the political piece of that, the people who make the laws, um, are aware of it. So I didn't think anything of it. I started optometry school and was a leader in, in our student body government. Um, and mind you, I was very, very shy growing up, extremely shy to a point where my parents wanted to have me checked medically because I wouldn't talk. And I would just start crying. If, if you asked me to speak to anyone, not publicly, and just one-on-one, -on -one, I would start crying. I was so painfully shy. So I, I didn't know what it was that triggered it. I think it was always about people just saying, well, if you care about this, then you do this. And and that's the lesson that I teach our, our young folks, too, now when I go to the high schools, is um, when you're shy, you really need to think about um, where you're putting your energies into, you know, thinking in your mind always. Um, what do they think about what I'm saying? What if they think I'm like this, right? And that whole time you're thinking about it. You're not thinking about the other person or the other the situation that you're in. You're not in the moment. You're not learning about the other person, learning about the situation. So that's been the most positive part about then um, getting involved with, with uh, doing legislative activities. So every year in optometry school, I would be sent to Washington, D.C., to Sacramento, and talk to legislators about what optometrists do. And realize that if, if I care also about, say, the environment or uh, women's issues, which I heard you had just had a very spirited um, 
uh, conversation about that the other day, um, then you, you need to just, you know, stand up and treat something. So, again, I didn't think anything of it. Um, I didn't think anything of it. I would get involved in, in different activities. Um, I, I would do um, volunteer work in Costa Rica, Romania, do conservation work there. Um, I would uh, speak at women's groups and, and work on human trafficking issues. Um, never thought anything except that the main rule was always, if you care about something, then you have to go and, and help out in some way. Um, so, I, I, that's, that was part of the conversation that Kimio and I had, is you, every single one of you, will have the opportunity to keep contributing to your profession. And I think us, as immigrants, we really are caught up in the moment of, we're here, you make the most of what, what you, you have from, from being here, right? Especially financially. And then you try to help out your family. And then you try to help out your extended family. And then when other people from your country come, you also try to help them out. And, and I think that's the difficulty, with it, at least for my Filipino community, that's the hardest part for them to get involved politically. One, we came from a government that was so corrupt. Why would you, right? So what my family said to me, especially my mother, it doesn't look like it because on the website it seems she's very, very engaged. But I tell you, even last night we were just at an event and she said, I hope she doesn't do this again. <laughs> this running for political office is just such a scary idea for her. Um, because that's what she had grown up with in the Philippines. And, and I said, you know, Mom, in this country, it's not perfect, but it's the closest thing. And it's, it's such a difficult concept because when you don't trust something, the message to me is, especially as a young woman, is don't make waves. Be a good little girl. Don't make waves. Get a good job. Get a good education. Start a family. And that's your job. Just keep within helping your family. The problem with that is everything that we're doing is affected by what the government policies are. Whether you like it or not, anything that you're doing is affected by that. Medicare, right? What you have access to in healthcare. So why would we even think that that's an acceptable position to have? To be able to just say, well, um, you see this on TV, all the media with all the negative publicity for politics, politicians? Why would you get involved in that? It's so dirty. And my answer to that is, why wouldn't you? Do you want them to be the ones always controlling them? Only the people who are ready to play that game? Or are you going to step up and say, I can't change it maybe, but I can slow it down. And I can at least say I tried. Um, so that was a big part of, of why, um, to this day, uh, after the election in November, so we earned 66,111 votes, and I had never run for any public office before, not city council, not school board, not other positions locally. This was big. The um, assembly district, we have 80 assembly members in California. And uh, out of the 80, uh, each district, each assembly district has at least 430 to 435,000 in the population. So I have to reach those people. And it's, it's quite a task to do that, especially if they've never heard your name. And here I was, running against a school, two school board members, um, one from each of the cities within my district, a uh, city council member who was very good friends with our state treasurer and made it very known that this is what he's wanted for the last 15 years easily that he's been in city council. And, um, and then another um, person there who was the mayor of the city. And so I was actually in the first run able to uh, gain enough votes to even beat the mayor. 
and then that was for the uh, primaries. And then the top two there go to the general elections in November. And then I was able to, to earn the, the 66,111 votes. And we were 917 votes short. So when they say every vote counts, it really does. I didn't feel anything negative about the result, the process, and what's going to happen from here. Because to me, what my parents did, I think that was a lot tougher, right? Um, and so I hope you, you'll think about that. Um, what I always tell our young people is, and you already are there, you find your passion, you study it well, the money follows you, right? And whatever rewards you feel, you want from that. But think about this. The reason I went into this next step was that I would go and volunteer for all these, I mean, you name it. I used to be a pig trainer at the, the, the Oakland Zoo. That was one of my, <laughs> my volunteer jobs. I mean, you find something you're passionate about and you just do it, right? And it's because there's a part of you that knows that's your way of giving back. Um, but you, you, can't, you can't let it slow you down. But be a leader in your particular career, your profession. So that's what happened to me. That's how I evolved into this. Um, everybody would keep sending me to these leadership programs and those bills say, you know, you're a woman, you're a woman of color. We've never had anyone in the state assembly who's Filipino, even though uh, the Filipinos were actually here in some, on some records in California even before the Chinese. And we've never had an assembly member who's Filipino. And, um, and women, uh, only 24% and at one point 18% of the 80 assembly, 120 assembly members and senators, okay, so combined there's 120, only 24% are women. And that's not how the population is really distributed, right? We have 51% women in California. So it's a strange concept um, that I wasn't ready to accept for a while. I always thought, ideally, that uh, when you're a public servant, your job is to go and talk to people and listen to them. And then you would incorporate what their needs are. And by doing that, then they do know how to service better because they listen to what your needs are. But the reality of it is, every time I would go into these groups and I would be the only brown girl there, okay, um, I would run into these issues like there was one meeting uh, we were the community advisory committee for uh, a healthcare community uh, district. And basically, uh, we would oversee the grants that would go to programs in different hospitals and different healthcare organizations. So we had money to give out, but we needed to find out how do we give out the money the most effective way to healthcare um, type of programs. And so we looked at the demographics of our district and we found that 56% said that they speak a uh, language other than English as their first language. So then everything else followed, that it was such a diverse community that whatever program we selected, we needed to make sure that those programs were culturally sensitive, that they had people who would provide different languages, right? And that this would definitely need to be somewhat ethnic oriented kind of programs. Person raises their hand. Caucasian, older white male. Okay. Didn't mean anything negative about this, okay? Honestly, this is his life experience. I have something against that, he said. Because really, he said, if we want to reduce hypertension in Eden Township, we really should just put money into anything that's hypertensive programs. Right? I'm anti hypertension I mean, because they should just learn English. And um, in any ways, you know, I just have something about like something ethnic, like 